All right, Sam, take it away. All right. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me okay? All right, I'm getting thumbs up. Awesome. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me. My name is, uh, my name is Sam Usley. I am a uh, former uh, Walt Disney Imagineer now at graduate school here at, at Notre Dame. Is my presentation coming through okay now? Awesome. Perfect. So yeah, so I'm uh, Sam Musley, I'm former uh, Imagineer right now, a graduate student here at the School of Architecture at Notre Dame. I'm in my first year of two. Um, and what I've tried to do here is, is present, uh, create a presentation that for the next uh, 30 minutes could um, inform you guys as to, you know, if you're looking for a potential career either in Walt Disney Imagineering or you're looking to go to maybe Universal Creative or, or something else in the entertainment design field, um, I'm trying to create a presentation uh, that is very, very pract practical um, skills and lessons that you can learn that you could, you could potentially take with you if you're looking to apply. Um, things that can help you maybe be a bit more marketable, uh, a little bit, uh, you know, in the hiring field, and also uh, some actual, something I don't think gets talked about enough, uh, actual like theme park design philosophy, you know, kind of rules of thumb that you can take with you if you actually are hired and you, and you do get to go into this world, um, kind of lessons that you can take with you into that. So, you know, who am I? Um, I have uh, five combined years at, at Walt Disney Imagineering. I began back in 2011 when I first, first interned there. Um, I started out really just as a, as a draftsman, as a CAD draftsman there working on the Shanghai Disneyland project, which is now open. Um, you know, it was, it, was, it was not glorious work by any means, but I did get my foot in the door. And I did get to, by doing that, I was able to meet some really cool people. I was really able to see the kind of work that was going, going on all around me. I used to I'd walk around at one, my lunch breaks and I would, uh, I would just kind of speak and spy on all the cool work that was happening. And I was able to learn a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of things that way about, about the industry. Um, and eventually I, I did go back there uh, after college, after, after interning during college, I, I did get hired there as a show set designer um, and was able to actually make my way into creative uh, where I got to work on a lot of blue sky projects, both domestic, domestic and international blue sky, if you're not familiar with the term. Um, is very kind of the earliest phase of a project. It's when we're looking at a blank sheet of paper. We usually have some sort of targeted objective from the company, but we're really looking at a blank sheet of paper going, okay, what are we going to build? What does it look like? Um, and I got to do a lot of work kind of uh, in the early stages of these projects, figuring out what these things would look like, uh, which was really exciting. Um, I'm also uh, the son of an Imagineer who worked at Disney for 41 years. Uh, my dad was there for a long time. I relocated around the world a couple times with my family, uh, mostly to Tokyo, uh, Japan, to, um, to where I watched my dad build theme parks. I grew up, so I've grown up around this world as well. I've had a lot of exposure to it. Um, and I've also had the privilege of mentoring under and uh, knowing and mentoring under some great Imagineers like uh, Tony Baxter and Joe Rohde, uh, and lots of other uh, really fantastic Imagineers. Uh, so that's my background. Um, at, from Imagineering. So I hope you think uh, I'm, I'm somewhat credible when I talk about this stuff. Uh, you know, I'm still, I'm still young and, and uh, looking to have a, hope, hopefully having, looking to have a long career at, at this, but um, so far, so far so good, I think. Um, I just wanna set some expectations real quick as to what I can and can't talk about in this, in this presentation. Um, you know, most of what I did, as, as I just mentioned, the blue, was in the blue sky phase of work which means that it was um, not yet released to the public. And so for the sake, all the artwork I did or, or the kind of drawings I did or the things I worked on, I, I unfortunately still can't talk about uh, because they, have not, they either are projects that will not happen or they projects that will happen in the future, but the Disney company is not ready to actually talk about them. Um, so what I am gonna try and talk about instead is um, I'm gonna use a lot of my own personal artwork to try and um, show you guys the kinds of drawings I would do without actually showing content I actually worked on at the Disney company. I'm gonna use publicly released artwork from my colleagues at Disney who did, who did have their artwork released or historic artwork from Imagineers in the past. Um, I'm also gonna try and give you just guys just ideas of skill sets you should learn and, and if you wanna get hired there or, or uh, have some marketability when you're looking to get employed um, and also just lessons, theme park design philosophy from uh, different Imagineers. Uh, that I got to learn from, which, you know, is just, you know, uh, out there in the public. And these are rules of thumb that I think if you work there, you should get to know. 
Um, and before I go, you know, gazing in, into the crystal ball and trying to predict the future of, of theme parks here, um, you know, just real, please realize this is really an unprecedented time uh, for the theme park world. It's an unprecedented time, you know, just in general worldwide. But as you probably are, most of you are all familiar with, you know, the Disney parks had to close for long, extensive periods of time uh, back in 2020 when COVID hit. The parks are still sort of in a, in a sort of COVID state of operating, depending on where you are in the world. Um, you know, it's sort of, it's, it's impacted the industry potentially you know, forever. You know, uh, the parks may not be exactly as they once were um, prior to COVID conditions. We'll see. Um, Walt Disney Imagineering itself, where I worked, has also been heavily impacted by uh, the new COVID world. Um, you know, you may have heard about the layoffs that, that took place last year. Um, you may have also heard that um, Walt Disney Imagineering, for the first time since the days of Walt Disney, uh, Walt Disney Imagineering is moving to Florida. Um, it's relocating to Florida, um, the whole company. And so there's a lot of people uh, between the layoffs and, and the relocation. There's a lot of people who are leaving the company. And have left the company, which is, in terms of the talent that's going out the door, is, is really is really sad and you know bad for the company. However, uh, for you guys, I do think you know I'm just speculating here, but I do think this may be a good opportunity for for those of you who are looking to come out of college and potentially work for Disney. This um, they're going to need fresh talent, and um, this is this you know I, I can't promise anything, but it, I do think that in the next. Uh, you know, in the next few years, they're going to be looking to fill the ranks again um, as they look to ramp up work again, hopefully following COVID. And uh, it may be a good time to start applying. And there's probably more opportunity than there is there would have been usually in a kind of big, big company like Disney that can tend to be have a lot of red tape and bureaucracy uh, tied into it. But just just know that what I talk about today, my experience, um, it might not be yours. You know, uh, the, the company is rapidly changing. Um, by the day, uh, literally just last week, I don't know if uh, you heard, but literally just last week, they were, um, the head of uh, the president of Walt Disney Imagineering stepped down, was replaced by, by uh, um, a new a new leader, and so you know, literally things are things are still shifting as we speak. Um, but like I said, I'm going to try and focus on on some constants that you guys can can um, really apply to your work that are very practical and not timely as much. You know. If you're wondering why I'm here and, and, and not at uh, Walt Disney Imagineering, um, it has really has a, a lot to do with COVID though. I have always wanted to come to Notre Dame. It was, it was my dream school as an undergrad. I didn't get in as an undergrad, but I did come here uh, back in 2011 as a, uh, for the architecture summer program, which I absolutely loved. And so I got to go, be familiar with the architecture school here. And I loved that here, they actually taught sort of these traditional hand drawing techniques um, that I was actually seeing at, at Disney Imagineering. Um, a lot of the work at Disney Imagineering is, is still um, by its nature, um, a bit more uh, tied into the past because we usually, whether we're building these sort of past worlds, these fantasy lands or, 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 you know, or even Star Wars, which has a sort of old world feel and texture to it. Um, I felt much more at home with the Notre Dame program in terms of its uh, emphasis on, on a kind of rich traditional tradition. And I felt that that was really applicable. Uh, to what I wanted to do at Disney Imagineering. I didn't get in as an undergrad, but um, you know, I did. Uh, once COVID hit, I was, I was happily working at, at WDI. I was, I was going on business trips, having a great, uh, you know, I was really having a great time working as an illustrator at, at Disney. And then COVID hit and literally overnight, all the work dried up pretty much just like that. Um, and we all got put on furlough. At first we thought, no, oh, just be a week or two. Then it turned into a month and it turned into multiple months. And uh, I decided that I needed a contingency plan. Uh, and I knew that layoffs were potentially coming. And so I decided that I'd apply to Notre Dame in case I did get laid off. Uh, fortunately, I was able to keep my job. Uh, I actually was able to keep my job. And fortunately, I also got into Notre Dame graduate school, which uh, so it turned out I, it was a nice choice to have. Um, I talked to my uh, talked to my leaders, my, my bosses at the company, and they all felt that, um, you know, it would actually be, a, I would actually really benefit from the program here and that it was applicable to what I was doing at Disney. And, and so I decided to take a, a leap of faith and, and, and leave the company, um, go to the program here. And, and I'm having a great time here at the, uh, at the School of Architecture here. Uh, I do hope to, you know, potentially go back to Disney after this. We'll see. I haven't, you know, 
nothing's certain. There's no guarantees that they'll take me back. You know, it's, it's like I said, it's a volatile world, but I do hope to go back into the entertainment design industry. Um, and I didn't burn in any bridges on my way out, thankfully. So, um, so who knows? Who knows what the future holds? But that's why I'm here uh, to pursue a master's or master's degree in, in architecture and design, uh, which I feel uh, more than any other architecture school in the nation has real applicability uh, to what uh, Disney does at Imagineering. And so I'm going to go over uh, some skill sets that have helped me uh, in, in my time at, at Imagineering. Um, but just, just so you know, there's lots of different roles at Disney. There's lots of different ways to get into Disney. You know, and I can't, I can't really go over all of them. I'm going to give you guys a skill set, especially if you're sort of an architect or, or an art engineer or artist. These are skills that I think would be applicable to you. That doesn't mean that these are the only things or that these are, this is the one way to get into Disney or that these are the exactly the skills that everyone at Disney needs. You know, I, there were people I worked with who didn't have any of these skills or only had one or two or, or such. But um, these I'm just going to show you are things that really helped me for my creative role at um, as an illustrator and concept designer at Disney. Uh, the first was actually uh, shorthand drawing. And so um, there's a lot of different kind of types of drawing, but one I don't think it's, it's talked about enough is this sort of shorthand drawing, um, call it a sort of napkin sketch uh, type, of, type of drawing. Um, these here, I can't actually show you the sort of uh, drawings I would do while in meetings at Disney, but I did have a sketchbook with me in every meeting I went to at Disney and I would draw uh, during the meetings, uh, whatever was being talked about, whatever I was, I was uh, pitch an idea, you know, I had my sketchbook with me and I do these little doodles uh, to follow along in the meetings. And um, I've, I've included here pictures of my notes that I take here at, at Notre Dame for my, some of my classes. It's just trying to kind of give you an idea of what my notes look like when I'm rapidly taking them. Uh, these are not refined drawings by any means. They're, they're really quick, they're really quick kind of little doodles, but um, trying to convey an idea rapidly. And I highly recommend, even if you don't want to become an artist, you know, even if you don't want to become an illustrator at the company, I still recommend learning to have a sort of shorthand type of drawing uh, because it will really, uh, it's a great way to stand out in the crowd when you're when, in one of these meetings. It's also a great visual tool uh, when you're in these meetings and there's lots of talk, 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 and everyone's talking back and forth. And um, sometimes having a visual aid during the discussion is actually is super helpful. And you'll see everyone will gather around the drawing and start to point and get excited, you know. Um, and also uh, actually as an illustrator, many different times I actually received work where um, uh, a leader would, would literally doodle on a napkin or, or, or a little postage stand or post, postcard or something. And they'd literally do a little doodle on whatever scrap paper they had and hand it to me and say, okay, turn this into a big you know, illustration of, of this land. You know, and it would be like, 20, 20 lines and I'd have to turn that into a giant illustration, um, you know? And so learning, to, uh, even if you don't wanna become an artist, learning to actually have a sort of a, a, a type of quick drawing that, that can help you communicate in meetings and, and help you communicate visually. We do work in a visual medium. So having, uh, learning this sort of visual method, I, I highly recommend no matter who you are. Um, now, if you do want to get more into kind of illustration, uh, if you want, if you do want to be creatively influencing projects at Disney, um, there are people like people like you know producers and, and writers who don't necessarily work visually. Um, but I have for me myself and for for a lot of people, uh, knowing how to draw, knowing how to communicate your ideas visually is is absolutely crucial. Um, so learning how to draw uh, for the for the iterative process is is highly highly important. Um, again, I can't actually show you work that I did. Well, I was in the company, but I can show you just sort of some of my drawings from my personal portfolio here on the right to give you an idea of the sort of um, type of drawings I would do both really quick, whether it's a, you know, a drawing that only takes an hour or two to drawings, and maybe you, I would have a day or two to work on. Sometimes at most, maybe a week I would have to work on a drawing of this, of this kind, but really um, learning how to illustrate your concepts uh, in a way that's that's uh, rapid and where, you're, where, where you don't fall too much in love with the, with the, with the design um, is really crucial because, you know, basically you'll be in a meeting and they'll say, hey, you know, we've got this idea, it's this, this and that, uh, we wanna see it for the next meeting, right? And so then you gotta go back to your desk and by the next meeting, you've gotta have to have an illustration that shows the concept you talked about along with maybe some of your ideas that you wanna pitch. 
And then usually what happens is you bring it into a meeting and then everybody starts to put their fingers in it. You know, they say, oh, move this, shift that. I like this, don't like that. Um, you have to be, you know, you have to kind of grow a thick skin and learn how to take that kind of criticism and be okay with the fact that a lot of people are going to be touching your artwork, wanting to push it and pull it and move it, um, that the artwork isn't going to be wholly your own. Um, <clears throat> so if you do become, uh, you know, an artist, definitely have some work that you do on your own for yourself uh, so that you can kind of have artwork that you kind of can maintain total ownership of. But when you're working, uh, when you're doing drawing for the iterative, iterative, iterative process, you just have to be aware of going to constantly change, um, you know, and you actually don't necessarily know what the final product's going to look like when you start drawing. Uh, you have to be okay with the fact that when you start, when you start doing a design, you know, it may be months and months and months till your team actually knows what the final things look like. You aren't going to get it right the first time. Uh, and you have to be okay with that. Um, it's, it's, it's actually, I find it to be very fun. This is actually really, really where I like to live, uh, kind of coming into meetings and, and rapidly uh, coming up with concepts and pitching ideas. And um, it's, it's, it's very fun if you can get down to it. Um, I, I, I did my drawings both digitally and by hand, sometimes both. Um, so I, I'd, I'd go, I'd move back and forth between those mediums. Um, but it's really um, highly recommended that you know, this, we, we live in a, we work in a visual, in a visual medium with theme parks. And so learning visual tools, I highly, highly recommend. Um, and if you do become, want to become an illustrator as well, um, really learning how to do high level, high fidelity drawings uh, for presentations is a high, it's a highly sought after skill. Not many people can do it. Um, I only did one or two, maybe three drawings in my whole time there that maybe could possibly be considered sort of high level of presentation quality. And I'd literally have to spend, you know, months on them uh, under the supervision of, of, of leadership who would say, you know, oh, we want a little, you know, churro stand over here, right? You know, it, these, these drawings have to be able to encompass all the different um, ideas and, and accurately detail all the different things that a team that you're drawing for has been working on. Um, and, and, not a lot of people can do it. And so this is a skill set that um, if you can learn it, it's highly sought after. Um, you know, these, these two paintings here are by uh, Chris Turner and Greg Pro, who um, are still at the company right now. And they're, they're really some of the best in the world at this sort of thing. And, uh, you know, and a lot of us, while we were there, a lot of us other illustrators were, were constantly asking them questions, constantly trying to learn from them. They, they were great about mentoring us, teaching us. You know, so I was I was able to to start doing illustrative work, not knowing how to do this kind of thing, um, but I was able to kind of mentor alongside with them and, and try my best to learn it. Um, you know, is really really the highest level of, of drawing um, that's done at the company and and executives these days they 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 want more and more detail, um, and as well when you release things to the public, you know the public's going to be looking very carefully. At, at these types of drawings, right? And, and they're, gonna, they're gonna be looking for every little detail. So it needs to be, these things need to still be kind of fun and, and lively as paintings, but also absolutely accurate to what's the product is being made. Um, one of the types of drawings um, as well that we use constantly um, is the bird's eye. And the bird's eye is what helps us to kind of orient uh, the viewer's imagination to what we're presenting. Um, obviously by, by taking this view that's very far up in the sky, it's not necessarily a view that most, it's not a view that we're gonna look at, uh, but it does kind of help us um, when, we're, when we're thinking about a project in, in the whole, trying to understand the project from, from um, when it all comes together. Uh, these drawings are very important. And this is a type of drawing that's used very, cons very commonly in the industry. Uh, the two are on the right are my own bird's eye drawings. The one on the top is a digital uh, drawing. The one on the bottom is a bird's eye I actually just did uh, last week for my project here at Notre Dame. Um, and the drawing on the left is a drawing by the famous WDI artist, Herbie Ryman. And that is the drawing that actually sold Disneyland to ABC. That's actually the drawing that got Disneyland funded. Uh, Walt Disney basically kept Herbie Ryman uh, in over the weekend, uh, asked him to kind of pull an all-nighter with him and uh, had him do and kind of stood over his shoulder as and guided Herbie as he did this drawing here. And that's the drawing that Walt Disney literally took to the bank and pitched, um, and, you know, and, and pitched to them and, and got the funding to build Disneyland on. 
So these drawings are, are really absolutely crucial to selling the big idea um, whenever we're working on uh, projects, especially with sort of projects that cover a larger footprint. And then we have drawings that uh, actually come right down to the guest perspective and are really trying to tell you what it's like to actually stand in the space. Um, these drawings are also really crucial um, to get to know. And a lot of it is trying to find the right balance between showing the actual guests and people themselves and actually trying to show the design that's behind it. Um, you know, very often in, in architecture school, it, it's very easy to focus on the architecture itself and kind of avoid drawing the people. Um, but then there's also people, there's also, you know, illustrators who get very comfortable drawing people, but eh, they're not so comfortable drawing buildings, they're not so com comfortable drawing landscapes and backgrounds. And so learning how to actually do both, just have the right balance between the two is really um, absolutely crucial. Um, you know, you want to be able to show people having fun. But I've definitely seen a lot of drawings uh, where there's, uh, there's lots of people pointing, laughing, having fun. But there's, when you actually look at, okay, where's the design? What's, what, what's the actual design here that we're pitching? There really isn't anything. It's really kind of ambiguous and fuzzy. And so um, there are definitely um, learning how to incorporate people without using them as a crutch to making something that's actually not that interesting, more fun than it actually is, is really, um, is really crucial. I, I highly recommend uh, getting some, you know, looking at the artwork of say of Sam McKim, of Herbie Ryman, of of, of these great original um, Imagineers who who designed the original Disneyland, and I'll I'll show you guys a few more of those as well as we go along. Um, we also have one of the last uh, sort of um, uh, places in 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 really in, in sort of the design world that in which we still do hand drawing. Um, it's actually at WDI um, in sort of the concept architecture world. A lot of the cart concept architecture um, still starts by hand, even though it's eventually put into computers, eventually built as 3D models. Eventually it's introduced into what we call the BIM process. If you know Revit, you're familiar with the, the BIM modeling, with the BIM process. But um, at WDI, we still have these sort, of, these sort of Renaissance artists who still at least begin designing by hand. Um, and usually that's done through the sort of concept elevate, these sort of elevation type of drawings. Um, I've included two of, of my own that I've done for projects outside of Disney on the upper right there, but also at the bottom drawings by Herbie Ryman, drawings by Harper Goff, uh, showing um, how you know, great ways to, to do these sort of concept elevations that um, eventually these drawings go into actually informing the technical drawings. They actually begin the process of, of introducing real constraints. Because one thing to have a painting that's sort of in, in perspective, but you can't measure a perspective. You can start to measure a concept elevation. Um, and so if you, if you can actually learn this sort of lost art of, of sort of, of uh, sort of rent the Renaissance man way of, of, of drawing, um, you can actually make yourself highly marketable. It's one of the reasons I'm actually here at Disney because this is one of the few places in the world where this sort of uh, skill is still taught and passed down. And so it's one of the reasons I'm here and trying to get better at it. Um, but of course, we, we also live in a, a digital world and a, a, a world with, with really powerful 3D tools and we wanna be able to use those. Um, and so uh, something I've also found very helpful in my career, career is learning 3D softwares, uh, not just for the actual kind of BIM process and, and, and uh, you know, production process, but also for um, actually cons you know, doing rapid concepts of ideas. Um, I find it very helpful to move back and forth between hand drawing and 3D modeling. I find that um, the 3D modeling can actually inform my, my hand drawing and vice versa. Sometimes I'll do a sketch and then I'll throw it into the computer and I'll start to model that sketch. And when it starts to get a little too stiff, when it starts to get a little too, you know, computery, then I, then I throw it, you know, I'll print out a picture, get some trace paper, draw on top of it. And so I, I find it really helpful, um, especially when I, when I am on a quick deadline and I'm trying to, you know, rapidly concept something and I need to, and I need to situate my little sketch in, in, in real space, right, in real 3D space, I find it very helpful to be able to move back and forth between uh, digital and hand tools. Um, sometimes I've even presented work at Disney just purely digitally. Um, there were definitely projects that required such a, th that they were so um, complex in terms of their um, three-dimensional qualities that I actually, you know, I, I really just had to build these things in 3D in order to prove that yes, this can work, right? Um, and so 3D is a really powerful tool in that way, but it can make your work kind of stiff. So definitely if, if you're trying to be creative 
you know, um, definitely learn 3D, but I also recommend mixing it with hand drawing because um, to prevent it from becoming a little bit too rigid to becoming, you don't want the computer to be doing the design for you. You want the, the computer to be helping you uh, amplify your own design, right? And, and helping you achieve your own design. Uh, but there is a danger that the computer becomes sort of it's starts to drive a certain look. And, and that's why there's so many, actually, if you look around today, there's so many buildings um, that are being constructed today that look like they, you know, I can look at a building on going up on the street corner. I can usually say, oh, that was built in Revit. Or that was built in CAD, right? Because these software tools, they, unfortunately, if you, if you don't control them, they control you. And um, they start to really drive home the design. And for what we do at, at, at or, you know, what, what I say, we, uh, for what Imagineering does, um, it really has to feel, especially a lot of the places we build really have to feel kind of hand hewn. And so um, digital is very powerful tool. I have recommend learning it, um, but just be wary that it can uh, make your work a little bit stiff. Um, just in terms of having some entry level skills in order to, to be employed, um, just you know, be aware that the job you probably want at, um, at a place like Imagineering is not the one you'll get hired to do, um, but that's okay. That is okay because you know, if you can get in the door, get in the door. You know, um, even if it's a job that doesn't sound very fun, you know, get in the door. I you know, I literally started my first job at Disney was literally um, calculating the area of the acoustic ceiling tile in the ceilings of the sort of back of what we call back of house, sort of the, the utility buildings in the back of the park and, and literally counting the surface area of bathroom stalls, right? It's, it's the least, like the least fun job you could possibly have. But because of that, because I was able to get in the door, uh, because I, I was able to start meeting people and I was able to start seeing the kind of skills I would have to learn, uh, that eventually led to me eventually being able to become an illustrator. But it took years and years of sort of paying my dues doing boring stuff like that in order to get to that point. So just know the job you probably want is not the one you'll get hired doing. That's okay. Um, but so these are some skills here to get the job that you probably don't want, uh, but the one that might get you in the door, uh, which is really invaluable. And so knowing things like Revit, knowing things like AutoCAD, knowing how to model in Rhino, uh, knowing uh, vector programs like Illustrator and even you know Photoshop. Um, I use Photoshop more for creative stuff, but um, illustrators use, can be used more in production, um, laser cutting, things like that, because it is a vector-based program. Um, knowing these, these skills will make you highly marketable to help you get in. Um, but if you are lucky enough to actually get in the door, um, then just know that um, if you do want to be involved in the creative process, you're going to have to move beyond these skills. Um, and I had to, I had, you know, I was able to get in as a draftsman, like, like I said, counting, <laughs> counting acoustic ceiling tile and CAD. Uh, but I quickly realized that if I actually wanted to be influencing rides, if I wanted to be influencing the sort of creative decisions being made, um, I'd have to learn more than just CAD. And so I had to, I literally had to start teaching myself how to, how to paint, how to illustrate, how to draw, how to watercolor, um, you know, and so that drawing that this kind of uh, diagram on the right just shows you know, it shows you skills on the left that I kind of started learning from architecture school, which made me employable, uh, which helped me get in the door, but I had to move towards the skills on the right in order to actually start to influence the creative process at the company. Um, so and if, you, if any of you have specific questions as to, you know, what your skill sets are and whether they're marketable and what you, maybe you should, should learn for a specific role at the company, I'm happy to talk about that as well. Um, and you just be aware, I, I know I've, I've been talking about more my route specifically as, a, as an illustrator, but just know that there are tons of different uh, roles at Imagineering. It's, it's a very, um, there's a lot of variety in terms of what people do. Um, there's, there's show producers who sort of act like, you know, if you think about a film, there's the director and then there's the producer and the show producer very much acts, acts uh, very similarly to what an actual film producer would alongside an art director. Um, at the company, there's, there's writers. I have a lot of good friends at the company who are writers. Um, there were uh, graphic designers. There's people who work in models. There's people who are just lighting designers. There's people who mainly work in entertainment, you know, in live entertainment and shows. And there's people who, um, who just work, coordinate all these people. In fact, I, I was able to eventually get to my job as an illustrator by doing coordination work. I was a draftsman. Uh, but I'd been doing a lot of painting. I'd been doing a lot of painting on the side and I'd been showing my boss my paintings just to keep her aware of what I was practicing. 
And uh, she talked to me and said, hey, you know, there's this blue sky project going on and they need a coordinator. And I thought, okay, well, that's great. I'm not, you know, I'm not a coordinator. But she said, if you do this work, you'll be able to sit in on these blue sky meetings. You'll get to see, be part of the creative process. You know, you'll be organizing these, you'll be basically or helping to organize the meetings for these artists. And I knew, and she knew I wanted to be an artist at the company. So I took on that role as a coordinator. So I did that job. I'd go to these meetings and I would coordinate, you know, I'd figure out this person needs to show up at this meeting. It has this content in it and I'd block out all those schedules. Uh, but then on top of that, I'd start drawing in the meetings and I'd start doing paintings in the meetings too. And I would start trying to contributing to the creative process. So I would do my base role as a coordinator, but then I'd also do extra uh, for the job I really wanted to do. And eventually the team saw that and said, Hey, you know, uh, we'd actually like to take you on as an illustrator for this project. So don't, you know, like kind of like what I was saying earlier, you know, you know you're going to have to wear a lot of hats before you get the job you probably want to do. So may, being flexible, uh, not being too pigeonholed and, oh, this, my name is Bill and, you know, my name is Sam and I do this and this is the only thing Sam does, you know, try, you know don't get locked into that. You're going to have to wear a lot of different hats and that's sort of the fun of it. Um, and also just be aware as, as you work that you kind of want to form a, an identity. This, this is sort of uh, very true for the entertainment world in that if, if you know, if, if uh, Spielberg's directing a film, uh, he doesn't say, hey, get me a composer. He says, hey, get me John Williams, right? He, you know, he actually, um, he doesn't just say, hey, get me some random uh, composer. Don't get me some random person. He, he, you know, there's people in the industry who develop an identity, who they develop an, uh, an identity from their work. And so you sort of, especially in the entertainment industry, you want to be able to do that. So it's not just, hey, well, hey get me an illustrator in the project. No, it's, it's hey, get me Sam on the project or get me, you know, Megan on that project, right? Um, so just be aware as you, you know, if you are, if you do get into the company, figure out what you want your sort of identity to be. What, what is your product? What is your stance? What is your perspective? What unique skills do you bring uh, to, a, to a role as a creative person at a company? Um, and this, is, this really goes for everybody, artists or not. Um, if you wanna have a creative, role at a place like Imagineering or Universal Creative, uh, you're gonna to have to learn how to do public speaking. You're gonna to have to learn how to present your work uh, verbally. Um, and, you know, this is often, and this, this can be very terrifying for some people um, and that's okay. I, I can point you to tons of people who, who, who started out uh, being absolutely terrified of public speaking, who were able to overcome that and, become, and became fantastic. Imagineers became at, who became fantastic at pitching their work and even doing, you know, or press conferences and or press meetings and being going on travel channel shows, you know, um, but it is a skill that you're, you're going to have to, to learn. And I do want to advise a little bit against, um, I think there's a lot of people who uh, think that there's sort of a Disney voice to how we present things. It's sort of very kind of happy, cutesy kind of way of talking. And um, it's not necessary. Uh, in fact, I, I think I think if we actually look back at Walt Disney, look at the way that he actually presented uh, his work, it was very authentic. Um, it was not done in this sort of hyperactive sort of manner, this sort of hyper real manner. Um, he was very authentic. He was very down to earth in how he presented. And that was, I think, personally, so much more effective. Um, and it, it's worked for me very well. So there's, you know, if, if you think you have to put on some sort of character or persona, and in order to, to do that, it, it's it really not necessary. Um, you know, being more your authentic self is really going to get you a lot farther than trying to, to put on some sort of becoming some sort of cartoon character to present your work. Uh, and also, you know, don't talk down to your audience. Uh, don't, you know, I, I think sometimes because we work in this sort of um, entertainment medium, it's easy to, to, to talk down to the audience a little bit. But Walton, it felt uh, most of the successful uh, people I've seen in the company don't do that either. Um, you know, so learn how to pitch your work, but you're also going to have to back that up with real results. Uh, there's definitely sometimes people who have a sort of silver tongue who are able to, who could sell you, you know, uh, they could sell you a jar of dirt, but um, they can't actually back that up with real results. So definitely learning, like all the other skills I've been talking about, learning how to back up, you, you know, talk the talk, but also walk the walk, right? Um, and some, some creative, there are some creative leaders of the company who actually don't draw. There's art directors who actually really don't do a lot of drawing. They just do a lot of speaking. They do a lot of verbal explanation. They do a lot of um, uh, describing that way. 
and they're able to be successful, you know? And so if you, if you really feel like you're someone who, oh, I can't learn how to draw, then you're going to, okay, but you're going to have to really learn how to describe your work verbally and tell stories and, and kind of really, um, you know, learn how to, to speak. And, uh, and there's lots of successful people at Disney who do that. And so um, now that I've kind of gone through some skill sets that I highly recommend anyone who's looking for a creative role at the company to have, I'm going to go more into uh, what I think are some <clears throat> uh, good rules of thumb uh, to have when, when approaching creative problem solving at a place like Disney. And these are things that uh, takeaways I've learned from different masters, whether I've read about them or um, talked to people who knew these, these great Imagineers or, um, or I've actually got the opportunity to mentor under and actually know some of these Imagineers personally. Uh, so these are lessons that I've learned. I, I, I don't think theme park design philosophy is talked about enough. Um, I'm trying to, I'll try to keep this practic practical. Uh, so I, these are things that you can kind of take away with and um, if you ever end up at the company, but this is also my perspective, just be aware, you know, there's lots of different perspectives on this sort of thing at the company. You know, this is just, this is just my two cents and you, you can take it or leave it as you will. <clears throat> you know, uh, I think if we look at Walt Disney himself, we can learn that um, how important it is to actually be a, use your own product, actually be a fan of your own, actually be a fan of your own product. Uh, Walt Disney built Disneyland because he wanted one. He wanted like the biggest, coolest, you know, toy train set, you know, that he could possibly have. And, and he, and he built that um, and he invited everyone else in to come and enjoy it himself. It, you know, Walt was authentically a fan of everything that he did at the Disney company. If, and if his heart wasn't in it, uh, then usually the Disney company wasn't really wasn't uh, following him down the road on that. Um, all, most all of his projects were real passion projects for him you know, and, and, and he never, um, even though he was this famous, um, man, Walt Disney, and he had this, this persona, this sort of uncle Walt persona, you know, he never, um, he never let himself sort of become above it all. Um, he, he would stand in line at Disneyland and he would kind of ruffle his hair a bit and he would kind of, you know, wear his, his shirt a little scruffed up and, and he would stand in line with guests at the park and actually just listen to them talk and people would stand, be standing next to Walt Disney, not even know it. And he'd hear their complaints, you know, and he would pick up trash as he walked around the theme park. Um, he had his own backyard railroad. Uh, I've actually been to out in California. They have Walt Disney's, uh, his barn where he used to actually build his locomotives and build his, his model railroading uh, things. And, um, you know, he had his own backyard railroad and he'd build tunnels under his wife's flower garden, you know. Uh, and uh, when Disney, when he built Disneyland, he'd actually go down there before Disneyland opened at 7 a.m. and he would get in the milk car and he would drive around Main Street in that milk car in the morning and, and the cast members would see him going by. And, you know, there's, there goes Walt in the milk car. And he had, a, he had an apartment in the firehouse at Disneyland if, and uh, where there's actually still, there's always a candle. Uh, the light in the window is always still on because whenever Walt would go and to the park, he would light that, that uh, light in the window just so the cast members knew he was there. And ever since he's passed away, they've left that light on. And so he had his own room at the firehouse. Uh, it, and I think that what I'm trying to say is all of that actually translated to real results for the product. You know, he made, you know, all of that because he was such a fan of his own product, it meant that the, the product itself, I think, was better. And uh, there's, if you, you know, remember anything from this, I would just, you know, make sure you remember that if you aren't having fun with what you're building, your guests aren't having any fun either. You know, just, just try to remember that. Uh, one of the earliest Imagineers, one of my favorite uh, inspirations is, is Herbie Ryman. He was a Hollywood illustrator who came to work for Walt Disney. He was the one that did that drawing I showed you earlier that sold uh, Disneyland to the bank. And uh, I think Herbie was very successful because he loved, he loved people. He, he used to travel the world and he would actually sketch people all over the world and he'd sketch places all over the world, the places they lived. Um, and so when he started drawing Disneyland, he brought that love of place, that love of people into his drawings. And it just, it just leaps off the page in, in whatever he's doing. And I think he's a great example of learning how to draw in such a way where you, you have the people uh, celebrated at, who are who are still part of the image, people, very, very human paintings, uh, but at the same time, there's design rigor and the architecture that's behind, you know, often in a lot of these paintings, if you look, the actual architecture is only one slice of the overall painting. You know, this, this painting here in the upper right is a design for New Orleans Square, 
Uh, but the architecture only occupies about one third of the whole painting. Uh, but there's still a lot of design rigor to that image. Um, it's not just, he's not putting it there, except, you know, so he doesn't have to do any work. He's, he's, there's absolutely an intentionality uh, to how he painted that, that translated into the real, the real thing. And I also think it's good to look at Herbie's work in understanding where, how uh, theme parks are similar to the real world and how they're a bit different. Um, we, the way theme parks are designed, they're actually designed oftentimes to be better than the real thing. You know, I, I had a chance to actually visit Marceline, Missouri, um, where Walt Disney grew up that inspired Main Street on my way out here. And, and comparing that Main Street to the, the one we built at Disneyland, the, you know, Marceline's cool and all, but the, the one at Disneyland's better. And if we look at uh, Disneyland's New Orleans and compare it to the actual New Orleans here, you notice that the actual New Orleans is on a grid. So what happened, the result of that is now that uh, you get these sight lines towards all these modern skyscrapers at the end of, say, Bourbon Street, you know, and your eye can't really focus on the buildings themselves. Your eye is sort of drawn towards the end of the street. And so this endless, endless void of the grid. Um, whereas at Disneyland, we actually have, you know, when Herbie designed New Orleans Square at Disneyland, he created these little pockets. He created these winding streets, things that actually didn't exist in the real New Orleans, but actually helped to create more adventure, uh, more life and give more life to these, this little corner of Disneyland. New Orleans Square, it's not very small, but it, there's so much life uh, and, and detail to that whole area. And it's designed in forced perspective. So it's a little bit more charming, you know, having those, the upper floors are about at two thirds scale where the lower floors are at a full scale. And um, that actually makes sort of the designs actually feel a little bit more human, a little bit more uh, inviting, a little bit more charming. Um, and also New Orleans Square, it's an incredibly complex mix of lots of different uses. You've, you've, got, you've got a steam train pulling in, you've got riverboats passing by on the river. Uh, you've got a water ride that's going up and down and under, underneath the whole complex. Uh, you've actually got a hotel and, and special, you know, um, a dining elite club on the second floor intersecting everything. You've got shops and retail on the ground floor. You've got a restaurant that overlooks that ride. Uh, you know, there's so much happening all in that one and then that one space. And I think um, a lot of times now, and I've noticed this uh, when, I, when I worked at the company, it's very easy to want to segment off everything in your design to split everything up and kind of have it live in its own space. Say, okay, over here is the restaurant, over here is the ride, over here is you know the show, and, and every no, nothing touches. Um, but I think looking at Herbie's work, it's a great way of understanding that actually everything there's so much life that can happen in, in theme park design when everything is intersecting. Just like in, in the actual New Orleans, when you actually have these mixed uses, when you have li people living on top of shops and living, and there's people performers in the street that adds so much more life to the area than when everything's just sort of separated out into its monofunctional zones. Another great Hollywood illustrator who worked on uh, the Disney theme parks, which uh, who helped design a lot of my favorite buildings at Disneyland was Harper Goff. And you might, um, most of you would probably know him if you've ever seen Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, uh, Willy Wonka, excuse me, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, uh, the original one. Um, he designed he, all the sets for that movie, including the giant chocolate palace room that you first walk into that has that fantastic reveal. He designed that. He also designed the famous Nautilus submarine, uh, but he designed, he designed so many of the original buildings at Disneyland and all my favorite ones. And, and as you, um, and you can see some of them on the right there. And it's a good example, I think of, of what, you know, what, what does sort of a, a theme park architecture look like? It's not necessarily real. It has to feel real, but it does, it's playing with scale. It's playing with, with charm. It's playing with um, kind of more movie, movie film techniques. Um, uh, that maybe are a bit different than how you would design a building, say, if you're working at Gensler or working um, at an outside firm in the real world. Uh, and another good lesson I think we can learn from Harper Goff is actually in the design of World Showcase in Florida. Um, my, many of you might not be aware, but when Epcot was being designed, the original idea for World Showcase was to actually have all the nations of the world uh, looking exactly the same. Uh, situating in the, the model there on the upper right. Everything was going to be housed in a sort of contemporary building in which every nation in every nation's pavilion was sort of um, had the same facade. And Harper Goff started doing these drawings where he showed the different nations of the world actually with their own unique identities, their own unique vernacular architecture, really showcasing themselves individually, all spread around, around this lagoon. And, you know, initially he was not in charge of that 
he was not in charge of that design. He was not in charge of that project, but people started walking by those drawings saying, Hey, that looks pretty cool. You know, actually that kind of looks better than what they're, than what they're doing. And um, I think it's, it's a good lesson to say when you create good work, it, it can speak for itself. And you may have to, you may have to, you know, be a little patient in how you present it. You may not actually, you know, you might have to not force it on people, but if you produce some good work or a good idea, um, you know, it can speak for itself. And sometimes uh, that's maybe what it takes to, to influence an entire project, like say an Epcot theme park project. Uh, another great artist to look back to, uh, Imagineer. He, he wasn't actually uh, Imagineer really, he did some work for Imagineering, but John DeCure, um, I highly recommend that anyone who's interested in, in, in theme park design should watch tons of the old sort of film epics, the sort of Hello Dollies, the Ben-Hurs, um, the Ten Commandments, uh, you know, all these old films where they actually built physical sets, Cleopatra, where they actually literally, they took corners of Century City out in California and they would literally build these physical sets for these movies. Um, and so much of theme park design has its roots in these, in these original film sets. Now, when they were taken to the theme parks, they had to be built a little more sturdy. They had to be built to last longer than these film sets were. Uh, but so many of the principles that are, that are used in theme park design come straight out of film. And so I highly recommend looking at, uh, definitely there's, there's some newer films that still have a, a rich quality and compo of composition and set design, but um, definitely the old epics. If you really want to understand where a place like Disneyland comes from, definitely watching a lot of those old epics. So, um, Getting now into more con contemporary uh, Imagineers that I actually got to work with. Um, I had the privilege of, of working with Joe Rohde uh, on a couple projects um, and also hearing him speak multiple times on different topics at the company. And um, it struck me that Joe was always trying to, he, he's now left the company as of this last year, he now is heading up, <laughs> he's actually helping design uh, space travel experiences at Virgin Galactic. Um, but <clears throat> he was the one who, who really headed the Animal Kingdom project as well as the sort of Avatar Pandora project. And he uh, did some Marvel projects as well. Um, he had a pretty storied career with the Disney company. And he was always trying to, um, in my opinion, I think he was always trying to achieve a certain authenticity in theme park design that um, <clears throat> really, I don't think has necessarily been matched anywhere, anywhere else. Um, and he, in his theories, in, in his idea of, about authenticity is, you know, a lot of people would describe theme parks as fake. And, and to, to Joe, um, he, would, he would describe as actually, as the guest is actually having real authentic experiences. When, when these things happen to them, when you actually, when you uh, ride Expedition Everest and you and your family go on this ride and you experience this Nepalese kind of culture for the first time, that's an authentic, you know, that, that is real, right? You had a real experience with your family. Sure, the architecture may be made of plaster, but you had a real experience of this Nepalese narrative tradition. Um, and you actually learned something that day and, and you actually had a real adventure with your family, you know, uh, uh John Hench had a, a very a kind of simple equation, fear minus death equals fun, you know, and, and when you go, when you have an adventure with your family where you literally blast through Mount Everest on this, on this crazy coaster, you know, and you, you and you, you, you come close to, to death without actually being in danger. Uh, that's a real adventure that has happened to you and your family that you can take home with you. That is, you know, and that's authentic. Um, and, and Joe was also always trying to, um, if you go around Animal Kingdom, I highly recommend studying the different, ironically, the architecture in Animal Kingdom, um, because it's, it's highly rigorous. It's, it's some of the most rigorous design that's ever been uh, done by Disney theme parks. And it's, if you look at sort of maybe this, for example, this bottom image here in the Harambe market, um, you can see just how much intentional thought there's placed in every little piece of that facade. You know, the plaster is peeling away over time to reveal the actual stone masonry behind it. There's some bicycles that have been left there. Who left those bicycles, right? What, <clears throat> what was their socioeconomic status? You know, how was the, you know, there's some metal that's placed, there's kind of some corrugated metal over the window. Clearly it's been patched up a little bit. Where did that metal come from, right? Um, there's thinking and thought and intentionality between every little piece of design that's placed here in this architecture. And even though, yes, it's made of plaster, um, there's absolutely um, kind of a, a revealed narrative behind everything to look at there. 
Um, and Animal Kingdom is one of the best. It's not the only park that does this, but certainly under Joe's leadership in Animal Kingdom, he was always very, he was always very insistent. And, and especially on the projects I worked on with him as well, he was always in, very insistent that everything we build had to have an absolute intentional logic to it, even though we were making it out of plaster. Everything had to be very intentional. Every little, every little thing we did had to um, have a real origin to why we were placing it there. Uh, he was also a really, he's also a, a crazy world traveler. He's extremely well read as well. And uh, he, every day he'd come into a meeting, you know, he'd cite some, you know, a, a book he'd read last night. So he was incredibly well read. He was always, a, he was always learning. He had an incredible career, has an incredible curiosity for learning. Um, and he was always also a, a, a great world traveler. Um, you know, I got to, to chatting him one time about his, his, his various expeditions. You know, he's been to the furthest corners of Afghanistan. You know, um, he's, he's not someone who takes the tourist path. And he actually, when they were doing, creating Expedition Everest, he actually took that team on an actual expedition to the Himalayas to inform that, uh, to inform that project. And there's a, there was an idea that, that, that Joe often um, talked about, which I thought was very interesting one to share. And again, it kind of goes back to his, I think was his, um, <clears throat> his attempt to legitimize uh, theme park design as a, as a real, you know, as an actual legitimate form of, of design in the design world. He, he himself was an art teacher. So I think that kind of comes out of his, his, his art teacher background. Um, and he talked about a lot about how we actually are a part of a, a long legacy at Imagineering. You know, what we, that, what we do actually didn't necessarily start with Walt Disney. Walt Disney carried it into a new era, but that you can actually look back and even the ancient Romans and see them using, um, using methods of, of illusion. Uh, there, were, there were actually sort of priests and, and sort of uh, you know, conjurers called magi, and they worked in, in illusion and, and magic. That's where the word magic, one of the, root, one of the roots of the word magic. And um, you can actually go back to these ancient cultures and you can all, go all the way back in the history of design and see that um, there were actually, there were always designs that, uh, that used illusion to tell stories, uh, to tell narratives. Um, if you look at the Pantheon in the upper right, there's that little arch there, that little arch in the center of, of, of that space there. And you wonder that, why that's there. Well, that was there, that place specifically there, so that as you approach the Pantheon, that arch would actually block out the rotunda. So as you approach the Pantheon, it, you, would, you would perceive that you're, only perceive that you're only entering that temple front. You wouldn't actually see the round rotunda behind it. So then when you actually pass eventually colonnade there of that temple front into the main rotunda, you're then surprised by the fact that you've entered this grand circular space. Um, you know, and if you look at the bottom there, that's the Villa Farnese in Rome. Um, and actually that is, that is using uh, kind of painting to, to create a false wall. Right, that's, that's a wall there, but it's painted to look like it's actually a colonnade going out to the river, right? And on the right there, again, is another use of forced perspective in, in, in Renaissance Rome. And so these were tools, these sort of tools that we use at Disney, the sort of the two-thirds scale, the forced perspective, um, painting to create space, you know, the illusion of space beyond where there actually is space. These techniques have been used going all the way back um, in, in design history and Architect and the other thing Joe would also often talk about is that design historically has actually usually been used to tell stories, to tell narratives. You know, if you think of the Gothic cathedrals, why they lined with stained glass, it's to tell that story, right? And there were entire feast days where your purpose as a peasant was to actually just go into the cathedral and just look at the stained glass and 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 just and and and, and just embody these stories that were on the walls there, you know. And then it wasn't really until the 20th century where we had sort of the industrial revolution and and the sort of this modern <clears throat> stripped away. Uh, design culture that uh, this idea that it, it was everything had to be strictly about the machine everything had to be strictly about the building and not about telling narratives not about telling stories and Joe was always trying to remind us that actually what we do what we do actually what Hollywood's been doing the whole time uh, was actually carrying on that tradition of of, uh, fic of kind of storytelling through design storytelling through architecture storytelling through space that even though it died in sort of the architecture world it's sort of coming back a little bit now um, what one of the reasons people love going to Disney, you know, uh, what is now downtown, the old, you know, the new sort of new downtown Boston so much or downtown LA is because it's designed uh, to actually work with the human brain. It's, it's articulated space 
that's designed with narrative in mind, the human brain. If we look at brain science, as Joe was always talking about the human brain, it's kind of what he was learning about brain science. Um, the human brain is wired to understand narrative. It's wired to understand things through, through sort of storytelling and mythology. And um, he was always trying to use that in our work. Um, I've also had the pleasure of, of mentoring under and, and knowing uh, Tony Baxter. I used to, uh, prior to coming out here, I'd be going over to his, his house for Friday movie nights where we'd usually watch some um, film epic and we'd talk about it and we'd discuss it. Um, and he is, he's just a, a, he had a really long career with Disney Imagineering. You know, if you're familiar with Big Thunder, if you're familiar with Star Tours, if you're familiar with Indiana Jones, Disneyland Paris, uh, a lot of the Fantasyland rides, Journey to Imagination and Epcot with Figment. And, <clears throat> you know, um, he had a really long career there. He's an actual Disney legend. And um, he, was, he was really the one kind of the creative head of, of all those projects. And um, he's articulated a design philosophy in, in a way that I think few have for theme parks. And I'm gonna share a couple of his principles with you. Um, he also actually mentored under Claude Coates, one of Walt Disney's original Imagineers and shown there in the lower right, he's Claude Coates was the one who designed those fantastic backgrounds for the Pirates of the Caribbean ride. As well as he used to do, he did the backgrounds for the Lady and the Tramp films and a lot of those original Disney uh, animations. He was sort of a background set designer. And so, um, having that connection to, to Tony and, and uh, it's kind of like almost having a connection all the way back to Claude Coates, which has really been a fantastic learning experience for me. Uh, one of uh, Tony's big uh, principles that he talks about that I've found really useful is his sort of three keys to a great ride. Um, number one, is it aspirational? Number two, is it thrilling? Number three, does it take me somewhere I couldn't otherwise go? Or does it take me someplace only Disney could take me if you're working at Disney? And these are the three things that if a ride has this, it's probably in really good shape. It's probably a really good idea. If it even has one or two of these things, it could probably be successful. If it doesn't have any of them, what are you doing? Stop. Um, Tony likes to talk a lot about the movie. If, if any of you are familiar with the, the old Tom Hanks movie from the 80s, I think it's from the 80s, the movie Big. Um, Tom Hanks plays this kid who, who wakes up in a, sort of an adult man's body and he goes to work at a, at a toy company. And uh, there's this meeting where they're pointing at this, they're coming out with a new toy and, and the, this corporate head guy is, is pointing at charts showing, yes, kids like robots, kids like buildings. And so we created a robot building and everyone claps. And Tom Hanks gets this toy in his hands. He tries to play with it and, he, and he, he's sort of confused. And he goes, what the heck? You know, and he raises his hand. He goes, excuse me, why is this fun? And, it, you know, the question, why is this fun is actually not asked enough in the creative process and entertainment design. You would think it'd be asked more, but it's actually not asked as often as, as maybe it should be. And um, you know, if we think about a ride, if any of you are familiar with the, super, the infamous Superstar Limo ride, which opened at Disney's California Adventure back in 2001, um, I had the pleasure of actually riding this when it did come out. Uh, it only lasted a year. Uh, it's, uh, you know, if you think about, is this aspirational? Uh, no, it was filled with these sort of really creepy, uh, CD Hollywood uh, uh, puppets that were really, you know, uh, really jarring. Uh, the ride system itself was very boring. It just moved along the floor. It didn't do anything interesting. And, you know, Hollywood's right down the street if you actually wanted to see Hollywood with all its CD characters. So, you know, <laughs> it, it did none of those things. And so it was an unsuccessful ride. But a ride that does do all these three of these things, the Indiana Jones Adventure at Disneyland, you know, Everyone who's seen an Indiana Jones movie probably dreamed of being Indiana Jones. You know, the, the actual, you know, everyone who's seen the movie remembers that the scene with the ball rolling down through the cave. And so they built that into the ride. This is one of the most thrilling things from the film. They actually literally built that into the ride. So you can literally sit in that Jeep and experience this ball rolling at you towards down to you towards the cave. You know, and obviously if, in visiting uh, sort of this ancient forbidden temple as an adventure is obviously a very, you know, an experience you really couldn't get otherwise get anywhere else you know same with big thunder mountain railroad you know uh, tons of people have always wanted to be cowboys and certainly riding a runaway train is thrilling and visiting the wild wild west is aspirational so again there's another um you know so just it it, it is a rule of thumb so it's not it's not perfect and you know and, and obviously designing rides is much more complicated than this but just always remember ask yourself why is this fun is it aspirational is it thrilling is it taking me someplace otherwise go can't go if it's not doing that you know, you're, you probably don't have a winner on your hands. Um, 
something else he, he's, he's taught me, which I really, uh, really appreciate is the difference between rides that actually happen to you and rides in which you're sort of watching things happen, rides that we might kind of deridingly call book reports. Um, and he actually compared and contrasts two, two projects he worked on. Uh, one was Peter Pan's flight early in his career. One was P Peter Pan's flight, which actually opened with Disneyland. And the other is a ride that Tony himself designed, which was Pinocchio's Daring Journey. And I remember riding with him on this ride and him telling me that, you know, um, if he had re redoing this ride today, he wouldn't have designed it in the way he did. Because when you think of Peter Pan's flight, which is one of the most popular rides at Disneyland to this day, even though it's one of the oldest, um, you actually take off in that pirate ship over London. The experience is happening to you. You come on, you know, Peter Pan shouts, come on, everybody, here we go. And the doors swing open and you in that pirate ship take off over this beautiful model of London. Whereas if you ride Pinocchio, you're sort of going through the, you know, the scene selection of the Pinocchio movie. You, you know, you're in this little Jeep thing and it turns the corner and go, okay, yep, there's Pinocchio. He's doing this thing and there's Geppetto and okay. And, you, and you're just sort of going through the motions and you're watching everything happen, but nothing's moving along in this little cart. Uh, nothing is really, the ride isn't necessarily happening to you. And um, so it's really important to remember when you're designing these things that the most important story uh, that the guest is going to remember is not what's actually happening to the characters. It's what's happening to them. You know, when you, when you go, when your kid goes home and you ask your kid, Hey, what'd you do at Disneyland? They're going to say, Oh yes, I watched, I watched uh, Peter Pan take off over London and with Wendy. No, he's going to say, I flew in a pirate ship. Right. And that's what he's going to remember. That's the story he takes away. That's the authentic experience that he's going home with. Right. Uh, another thing, Disney, uh, or another thing that Tony talks about is the sort of variety of experiences you can get at a park like the original Disneyland. It's a park where you can, and he talks about it in terms of these sort of three extremes. Um, it's a place where you can meet the 16th president of the United States, Abraham Lincoln, in great moments with Mr. Lincoln. You can ride a flying elephant, <clears throat> or you can go to space and blow up the Death Star. You know, that's a real, that's, that's a real, you know, variety of, of things you can do. And then all the other experiences sort of fit within that triangle of extremes, right? And, but it's, it's, it's important if you're ever you know, designing these things to think about, you know, having that kind of variety to avoid everything becoming too, you know, it, it's great if, you know, so there's a lot of amusement parks over there. They're just, they're just roller coasters, roller coaster after roller coaster, roller coaster. And if you love roller coasters, that's awesome. I like roller coasters. Um, but it's, if it's one after the other, after the other, and the only difference is between them is just the G forces exerted on you. Um, I don't it, that can get kind of redundant. Whereas like, I think what we do in the themed entertainment, we really try to broaden, really try to broaden the, the breadth of the experiences you can have. Um, but we do, you know, at a place like Disneyland, it's all tied together by so, sort of a common, a common um, attitude, a sort of common optimism that brings it all together, um, that ties all those really variant, uh, extreme different types of experiences together. Um, and I know I'm probably going over time here, so I just you know some final thoughts uh, before I, we go to Q and A. Um, if you're ever in a meeting, and I, I something a mistake I made early on in my career is I, I would go into these meetings and I, I, I'd have my one big idea, and I'd go into the meeting and I'd, I'd wait for my moment to present my idea, and then boom, I would you know here it is, here's my grand idea, and then people would say, oh that's nice, next, you know, like <laughs> in the meeting would just sort of skip along with, and, and I would. Uh, and I'd kind of be like, what? I had, that was my moment. That was my big thing. You know, so uh, I've, I call this going for base hits, not, go, not home runs. Uh, you know, if you think about baseball history, Ted Williams was a very consistent batter and Babe Ruth was always swinging for the fence. And so Babe Ruth struck out a lot because he was always swinging for the fence. And yeah, he'd get that home run and everyone would cheer, but it, it came with a lot of strikeouts. Whereas Ted Williams was just absolutely a consistent hitter. You know, when Ted Williams came to the plate, he was connecting with that ball. And if you go into these meetings and you just try to think about consistently moving the conversation along, consistently coming up with, it may not be your big, biggest, greatest, most grandest idea, but if you can consistently contribute in such a way that you're moving the conversation, you know, um, that's going to do you much better than if you sort of hold it all in and go for these sort of grand slams that, uh, you know, that it can, it can be kind of really deflating when you, when you put all your eggs into one basket and it doesn't work, you know, you're going to have a lot more influence if you actually con consistently contribute than if you just sort of try to, to take full ownership and hit these grand slams. You'll, you'll have those moments where those aha moments, but they're few and far between.
Um, also, like kind of like what I was saying earlier, if you do get into the company, that's probably not going to be the job you originally wanted to have. So prepare yourself for the job you really want. You know, look at the look at the people who are actually doing the job you really want, and figure out what their skill sets are, what you know, what they had to learn. And then if no one's going to teach you, learn. You know, figure out a way to go learn it yourself. I had to teach myself how to paint on my own. You know, um, nobody taught me how to do that. I, I signed up for some master classes online. I started sketching in Photoshop. You know, it took me a while. But I, I had to teach all those things myself, all those things on my own. My architecture school taught us stuff like Revit, you know, taught, but it didn't really teach me how to illustrate in this sort of Disney picturesque manner. I had to learn that myself, um, but it's worked out well for me. And then finally, you know, just some, something that's it's a little pet peeve of mine that I think we everyone should remember when they're designing theme parks. I just remember theme parks should be kinetic. We should be able to see people having fun. If you look at these uh, two images of the original Disneyland. Um, there's not a whole lot of story consistency happening, especially in that image on the left. In that image on the left, you've got uh, Matterhorn bobsleds with a monorail beam going over it. You've got these sort of sky buckets and then a sort of castle in the background. None of this makes any sort of story sense, but you know what? It's fun. And you're seeing lots of people having fun. And uh, a lot of, there's a lot of talk about immersion in Disney parks and that's great. And there's, there's lots of, uh, a lot of emphasis on immersion. And yes, that's important. Um, but also remember that it's, it's fun to see people having fun. Uh, and you know, there's, there's parts of the park where I think it's, it's okay if everything start to overlap. And, and it's fun if it breaks the, the story a little bit. Um, and I've seen a lot of times where there's sort of a, a sort of story, there's sort of a, a sort of worship of the, of the almighty narrative and story becomes a bit dogmatic and can kind of eliminate things, you know, prevent you from having fun and prevent you from designing something that's fun. And so, you know, if you've got a steam train going past a submarine, your temptation may be to put up a wall there because, you know, you think, oh, it's a steam train, it's from this period, a submarine's from that period, none of the two shall mix. But no, it's actually more fun. <laughs> Sometimes it's just more fun to have the steam train and see the, the submarine, you know. Uh, if it, that finally, just if you look at that lower image on the right, you know, uh, Walt Disney once stood on that river there and he looked out at, at that river and he saw the, the sailing ship Columbia going by, or he saw these all these ships going by and he saw the, the people on the canoes going by and he saw the rafts going to Tom Sawyer's Island. He saw the keel boats, the Davy Crockett keel boats. And, you know, he was standing with a, a, someone from operations and this person thought, oh my gosh, he's gonna, he's gonna complain that there's way too much happening here. It's chaotic, it's too busy. But, but Walt instead, he sat there, he, he stood there and he said, you know what this river needs is another ship. <laughs> you know, and so um, I, I think Walt himself really liked to design these places so that you could visibly see people having fun. And I think increasingly in the industry, we're seeing a lot of design where we're putting everything into these sort of sh hidden show boxes where, where uh, you know, yes, they're very immersive, but nothing ever touches and you never get any overlap. And, and uh, I think it's, you know, I think it's important to just remember that original theme park DNA. Anyway. That's, uh, that's my talk. I'm happy. Uh, sorry, I went over time there, but I'd, uh, I'm happy to take any questions you have now. Hey, Sam, thank you so much for everything. Don't worry about the time at all. That was great information. Uh, my, <clears throat> excuse me, my main question was, so obviously you had a lot of drawing background with architecture, but, and you hinted at it too with the master classes and everything, but what was the process of you learning after work by yourself, you know, with no real, yeah, you have a goal in mind, but you know, it feels like there's a mountain that you're trying to climb. How did you like navigate that journey of learning by yourself, personal development yeah, per se? Uh, you just, you have to get comfortable with the fact that you're going to make a lot of bad drawings. Uh, it's, 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 there's no show, unfortunately, there's no real shortcut uh, to learning how to draw. You have to get through a lot of uh, bad drawings. And I had to get through my share of bad drawings. In fact, I, um, I have some of them here if you if you want to see some of my bad drawings uh, that I had to get through. Um, but what I did, I, I was always looking at um, the artwork of like the Herbie Ryman's of, of the, uh, you know, John Hench. And I was always looking back to those original artists and I was trying to emulate them a bit in my work. And I would find things in the real world, like the old cities of, of Europe. Uh, one of the most helpful things for me for travel was travel. Uh, when I would travel and I would bring a sketchbook. And I would actually sit in the streets and I would actually draw different places that I was visiting uh, in the real world. Um, drawing from real life is, is going to help you the most. 
also doing, you know, doing figure drawing, but drawing from real life is going to help you more than anything else. If you, if you get a sketchbook and you just fill that sketchbook with a ton of bad drawings of you going out there in the real world. And, 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 you know, even if you're just on campus here at Notre Dame, I know it's a bit cold right now, but before it got super cold, I was going out there with my sketchbook and I was trying to draw different things around campus. You know, you can sketch off the computer, you can sketch off screens, you know, it's a, it's an imperfect thing, um, but fill a sketchbook. And even if, and you may think like, all oh, these are all bad drawings, but take a look at your first sketch and then take a look at the last sketch in your sketchbook. And I bet you'll see improvement. Um, one of the people that my, my dad hired, who's now very successful at the company, uh, she had a great resume and everything, but he asked her, he said, you know, bring me your sketchbooks from, from when you were an architecture student. He's, and he asked, all right, show me your first sketchbook. And he opened it. He took, he opened the first page of the first sketchbook. It was a really bad drawing. He said, okay, now show me your middle, you know, your middle sketchbook. He took a look at that one, opened to the middle page of the middle sketchbook. All right, I'm getting better. Now show me your last sketchbook. Went to the final page of the final sketchbook. All right, she can draw. Cool. When would you like to, you know, you're hired. Basically, he hired her on the spot right there because she showed that sort of dedication to learn, that perseverance to learn, right? And um, everyone's, everyone's going to start. Nobody's born in this world knowing how to draw. And um, something I always like to say as well is that it's about 5% talent and 95% work. Um, and in fact, most of the people, like if, if you talk to like guys like Greg Pro and Chris Turner, they would tell you like, you know, they were not the most talented guys in their class when they started out. But you know what, they had the best work ethic and uh, they continued to draw, you know? And so uh, I think it's very tempting when you're starting out to think, oh, oh I can't draw. I, I can't tell you if I had a coin for every time I've heard someone say, oh, I, you know, I can't draw. I can never draw. I can, it's just something I can't do. You know, I'd be a millionaire. Um, <clears throat> but it's, it's something you can do if you work at it. There is a, there is a small hurdle of like natural talent. You know, I really, I've always been pretty good with perspective, but I'm absolutely an idiot when it comes to color. I don't understand color and value in paintings. That's something I've had to learn, but I, I can understand like shapes and perspectives that that came more naturally to me, but learning how to paint with like that with tonal values. Oh my God. I, I'm still, I'm still terrible at it. Uh, it's something I have to, <laughs> still have to get over. Um, but just, I don't know, I recommend get through, fill a sketchbook, get through lots of bad drawings and, and eventually one day you'll wake up and realize, wow, I, I can actually, I can draw, you know, but it takes time and it takes work. Awesome. Thank you. And I really appreciate your uh, sort of historical perspective in comparison with like classical architecture with Disney. Uh, one of the images you had on there, the small perspective uh, statue that's in Rome, I think it's by Borromini, it might be on one of mm. my art history exams tomorrow. So I oh, really nice. appreciated that. Yeah, oh, good. That cool. <laughs> good. Yeah, a little refresher. <laughs> Nice, nice. I'm glad I'm helping you for that test. But yeah, it's, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's you know, um, for me as well, as we, as we discussed this, it, it's not a perfect correlation between what I've been studying here and Disney, but there's some, been so many principles. And in fact, my, my whole course this last semester was all about organizing streets and creating these sort of wine streets that inflect towards places of importance, you know, that streets that you can vision, that, that help people visually navigate through them. Um, not by putting tons of signs up, but just by having a, a logic to them and where things are placed. And that's what we do at Disney. When we put the castle at the end of Main Street, it's there to pull you towards the center of the park. And then there's these different, then these, uh, these other icons that will pull you this way and that. And the streets will inflect towards the attractions so that you're naturally guided towards the different important experiences that you make, you know, just like an actual old world city. You know, it's, it's not until we get to the modern century and we get these gridded cities, you know, or just everything is, nothing is allowed to, there's no hierarchy to it. You just get these endless canyons that don't actually point to anything, you know, um, and it's, they're a disaster. So, <laughs> yeah, but yes, thank you. I'm, I'm glad, I'm glad that there's sort of real, you know, uh, applicability to what you're learning here that you can, you can take things that you learn here that aren't necessarily theme park things and apply them to theme park design. Um, I'll jump in. I, so yeah, thanks. This was a, a really, really awesome talk and, and cool to see, you know, Thank you. this still early in your career of sort of, you know, um, finding a way and, and what you've learned so far. I, you talked about getting in the door mm. and I'm curious if you have any thoughts or insight on, um, finding, the opportunities that that aren't necessarily what you're going for, but mm. could be a stepping stone and marketing yourself 
as you know really wanting to do that or being really capable of doing this thing that isn't actually what you're training to do mm, mm. yeah that's a good point um most likely when you know if you're going on the the, the job site and you're looking at available roles at a place like uh, available roles at a place like imagineering it's not going to be the job that you're probably most qualified for um you know at, so I would just try to demonstrate, you know, it, it is tough to stand out in the crowd, but think about, uh, think about when you present your portfolio or, or even, even if you just present a willingness to like a portfolio of just some, some sketches or show some creativity in how you present your work. Don't just send in a cut and dry resume, you know, um, and show a, a breadth of experiences, what they're, what they're actually looking for at Disney, yeah, they may be looking for someone who can fill this specific role, but they also tend to be looking for someone who's a bit uh, flexible, who, who's, who's able to, to break the mold a little bit and, and approach things and problems in a creative way, right? And so if you can, if you can approach something like as, bo- as boring and dull and dry as a resume, and you can approach that in a creative way, that'll help you stand out, right? Um, you know, it, there's no guarantees, uh, there's no, there's no magic. Unfortunately, there's no magic one thing I could tell you that says this and this will get you hired. Um, the good thing is, like I was saying, there's been so much attrition over the past year that, that for um, people who are looking to become Imagineers, the next couple of years are probably going to be really um, great recruiting times for that. Uh, but just show whatever it is you're applying for, show creativity, try to do it in such a way that can you even make something as boring and dry and dull as a resume fun? Can you make it nice to look at? Um, you know, and can you, and if, if you are lucky enough to get like a phone interview, you know, can you conduct yourself in a professional manner and, and um, be, you know, present yourself as someone other people would actually like to work with as well. You know, it's not just about what, you know, it's also like what, whether or not people actually want to go to work every day and, and, and be next to you. You know, I've, I've known people who are really talented, but you know, they, uh, they can't really get work at the company because they're not a pleasure to work with, you know? And, and so um, all those things are, are, are gonna kind of help. You, even if you, if you do know you're applying for a role and it's say something you've never done before, like me with coordination, um, at least show some sort of visual aid, even if it's not very good, some, show some sort of aid that you have at least attempted to teach yourself, even if it's just in the last week. <laughs> that you have attempted to at least try to learn that skill. Um, usually they just want some sort of validation that, okay, this person is at least trying or at least can learn this skill, uh, showing a willingness to learn and that sort of thing. Uh, that'd be very important, but th- there's no one thing I could tell you that's it. Uh, yes. And if you do this thing, you'll get hired. Um, but just yeah, see if you can take the mundane and make it extraordinary. Uh, I think that'll help you stand out. Is that helpful? What's, what's your guys' background? Is it mostly um, engineering, industrial design for the group here? Yeah, That's I'm me, industrial design. I, yeah, I know there's a couple that are engineers. I think Solomon is an architect. Looks like he's there at the yep. building right now. I am. <laughs> I'm a film hey, major, Solomon. or I was a film major. With, I'm actually graduated with some like art experience. Nice. So yeah, I'm an artist. Fantastic. I'm an interior design major at the University of Florida. So I'm starting oh, cool. architecture um, for the first two years. I just finished my first semester and then I'm switching to interior design. Nice. Yeah, I actually, uh, one of my first jobs one of, was in interior design, actually. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's another, that is, a, that is a role at the company. Interior design uh, is, is, a, is one of the many roles at Disney. And also, Imagineering is coming to you. Uh, it's going to Florida there. So <laughs> you'll be close. <laughs> Did you guys find what I talked about helpful? Did you find it practical or, or, or you know, or was it, you know, uh, you kind of wish you did something else with your time? No, I found it very informative, especially that whole historical view, because it seems like Disney is sort of pigeonholed in its own little 
world and its own little fantasy land, but obviously it plays a bigger role. And a couple of my classes, I mean, at least at Notre Dame, are a little more, I guess you could call them classical or seem mm-hmm. to be, I don't want to say pointless, but in another world, in a world of yesterday. And mm. your point of how everything is relating together and I guess in a sort of mythology in a timeline yes. storytelling, I think that was really helpful and, um, you know, motivates me more to want to pay attention into those classes. And um, as I said, that art history class that I'm taking, uh, when the professor was talking about that one uh, forced perspective statue, and she said forced perspective, a fellow TEA member uh, in that art class, art history class had just shot up and he just paid full attention. Yep. So (laughs) it's really cool to see, like you said, the small details that can pay it, um, that help to uh, work at Disney and theme entertainment that you wouldn't normally think of. So it's opened up a whole new perspective that I'm trying to look through now after uh, your talk. I'd love it. Absolutely. Uh, you know, when I was in eighth grade, I'd, um, I'd already decided in eighth grade, I wanted to be an Imagineer. Uh, and so I had sort of had this attitude in school of, I'm really not interested in any class that isn't going to help me be a, an Imagineer one day, you know? And, and my, my eighth grade teacher was, she was getting kind of grumpy with me, not really paying attention. Uh, and so, uh, we were talking about, you know, we were starting to get into trigonometry a little bit. And she actually did this diagram on the board. She said, all right, Sam, if you, if you want to be a, you know, if you want to work for Disney, you're going to have to design roller coasters one day, right? She said, yeah. I said, yeah, okay. And she'd laid out on the board, she laid out a roller coaster path and said, all right, well, you have to understand how kinetic energy works if you're going to design roller coasters. Because when everyone, as a, as a roller coaster vehicle is traveling down this path, you have to understand that how much embodied kinetic energy there is still left in the vehicle in order to plan out the track. Uh, you know, my mentor actually, uh, he laid out Big Thunder Railroad using a string and, and using that to plan out the actual kinetic energy in the track, because there's a certain point where uh, you, know, you actually run out of energy and, and the, the vehicle will just stop dead in the track and you, you can't you can't go up anymore. So if, if you're going to have the vehicle go up, you have to have a certain amount of kinetic energy in order to, right, you know, there's all this. And so she laid out for me that this, those math equations I was doing in class that to me seemed completely irrelevant to what I want to do with my life are actually very relevant. To something I might be doing one day. And so um, definitely look at ways you can, even if you're not, uh, you know, sort of more an art, um, an art, art guy, like it sounds like you've got a lot of art classes, but there's lots of ways that you can take things that seemingly don't seem like they would apply to theme park design and apply them to um, your role with the company. Okay, I have kind of a random question. Um, What has been your favorite memory with WDI or like your favorite project? I know you can't really talk about it too much, but anything along that I'm super interested in. (laughs) Oh, favorite, favorite memory. Uh, I also used to work. I also used to work actually at Disneyland. I I did get some, if you get, and if you guys have the opportunity, I do recommend if you can maybe working at uh, for a summer or something, working at the theme parks as a ride operator. Uh, I did work as a ride operator for one summer at the theme parks, and I have a lot of great memories uh, from there with actual interfacing with guests, seeing actual uh, guest experiences there. Oh, favorite, favorite memory. I think it was when, okay, yeah, it was, it was when uh, I had been, I originally worked on when I first got to, to, to Disney in my 2011 job, like I said, I was planning bathroom tiles in the ceiling and I would have, I would have, I would have, you know, given anything to just design a little water fountain, just to, just a brick on a water fountain going into a new theme park. And then um, eight years later, I was doing this coordination job and I was painting, like I was saying, I was doing these paintings along with the coordination job that weren't really getting noticed too much. And then all of a sudden, one day, um, I came in with this, this image that really clicked with everybody. And all of a sudden, I'm going to work the next day and I'm doing artwork for this huge project. And I'm getting to plan out an entire area of, of this huge project. And it was that moment, I think, when I realized, oh my gosh, I'm actually, it was the first time I was really uh, got to have some creative influence over, over something. Um, it's so also if there's I can talk I can talk about this this thing a little bit. So in in Tokyo they're building a tangled ride, 
they're building a tangled a tangled ride in Tokyo. Uh, this has been released publicly, and I got to work on that on that ride quite a bit. And um, there was one moment on that ride where I was my job was to just kind of do some three D modeling for the ride, but I noticed an opportunity there in the in the composition of of the thing that nobody had really noticed. And um, I just did a little drawing showing like how that little area could be improved. And they saw that and said, yeah, let's do that. That's good. Let's do that. And it was like, wow. Oh my God. You know? And so just, just, just being able to, to see a little corner of this ride um, become influenced by my idea. It was like, to actually, when you actually see uh, your idea, having the, the, the work you put in so, and sometimes it's cause you, you'll, you'll go, you know, you'll go through days and days and days where you don't feel like you're getting nowhere. And all of a sudden, finally it all clicks over. And, you know, that's, that was, that was really a special moment for me. Um, also just walking in every day, walking past walking. I'd always like to walk through the model shop on my way to my desk. And I would just walk past all this beautiful artwork on the wall, all these beautiful models and just get inspired that way. Just being able to walk past that every day was really special to me. Uh, I'm trying to find like my one big uh, moment for you. Um, you know, I think uh, when I was actually working at the park, I had a couple of guest moments, just guest interactions that were really special. And, and, and that's ultimately where, what it's about. It's ultimately about, you know, the actual guest at the park. And, and when you actually make their day, that's, that's always the best thing. So what we do at WDI tends to be a bit more, you know, front loaded and we don't necessarily always get to see the guest reaction to what we do, but it's important to see that in the end. I used to like to tell kids that their churro was upside down. <laughs> no, let's get, there's just some kids go, huh? Oh, okay. Thank you. Another kid's got, uh, I see what you did. So that was always fun. <clears throat> I'm curious. Um, so, so I've worked in the industry as an engineer, and especially in engineering, you have a mix of people. Of, of some people, you know, really love the industry and and riding rides and going to parks, and other mm -hmm. people, they love the detail and the you know the safety and that side of it, and they don't ride rides at all. And they're mm. just not into that. They're into the work. They love the work, but they're yeah. not. Um, the theme park. I'm curious, what is the mix of that in Imagineering? Do people get really excited about these IPs or does that come and go? Are some people really focused on the details and other people are, you know, getting uh, caught up in the magic? Time? Yeah, it's definitely, there's a lot more pe people that, um, I'm actually, I'm continuously surprised as, as someone who's a fan myself, who, who just who loves going to the parks and, and just and laps it all up. Um, I'm continuously, I've been surprised a lot at how many people actually aren't that way at the park, but they're still successful at the company. You know, they, they, they like it for the work at hand, um, you know, and, but usually, usually there are people who are more on the technical side um, and they, they have a, these very marketable skill sets. They, they love the sort of, problem solving that comes across their desk even though they themselves don't necessarily love going to the, the visit the final result um and i know tons of people who are really successful my personal opinion you know my personal two cents is that i do think you know if you're going to work in this industry you should be a fan of it kind of like what i was saying about walt disney i think that can only help um, but I know tons of people who are success, successful, who really, and I'm continuously actually surprised by the number of people who are actually, you know, they really love the, the kind of problem solving that comes across their desk. I would say, if you do want to be a creative person, who, if you don't want to just be solving engineering problems, if you want to be creatively leading projects, um, then I really do think you need to be well-versed and understanding and, and even a fan of the product. Uh, because kind of like what I was saying earlier, if you aren't having fun with it, the guest probably isn't either. Um, there's more, I mean, I could, I could point to specific projects that I feel where that happened, but, uh, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to cast aspersions. <laughs> 
I wanted to ask you when you sort of like go into like blue sky, what are some of like the mediums, I guess, besides architecture that you like typically look at that are more, more like inspiring to you? It, uh, other than architecture, what do I look at? Yeah. Like, I guess movies are like, if it's mm. like history and stuff like that. Yeah, it's certainly history is something I really like to draw richly upon. Um, there's sort of the, the problem of the blank sheet of paper that Marty Scalar talked a lot about. Uh, and Tony Baxter talks a lot about it too. And, and what Tony likes to say is he, if you're starting out on a, a project, like let's say for him, it was the, the, the seas, the living seas pavilion at Epcot, right? You know, and okay, so you know, okay, I've, I've got to do this pavilion. It's all about the sea. Uh, what about the sea? What is there anything in my memory about the sea that I remember really inspired me? Really, you know, what perhaps in my childhood or later on about the sea really was impacted me. And for him, it was the Ten Commandments when Moses parts the Red Sea and you get these giant plumes of water coming up on the sides and boom, and there's this, there's this pathway through the Red Sea, you know, um, that really inspired him in terms of, you know, so he thought, okay, well, what if, you know, what if we've got this sort of, what if, uh, you know, uh, what if Neptune comes out and he's got his trident and he, he, and he kind of sh shoots his trident at the water and boom, that parts the, the, what if we could actually part water, you know, uh, as an entrance to the living seas pavilion. That's not what they actually built. But again, that was sort of how he, how he starts to think about it. That's, that's his method of approaching this stuff is actually going back when you've got that blank sheet of paper, going back to what, what things have really impacted you, whether it's, it was a, a film or, or a book. Oh, um, another another Tony moment. Uh, he was trying to come up with. He was working on the Journey to Imagineering uh, Pavilion. And if you, if are any of you familiar with Figment from the Journey to Imagination, right? Okay. So uh, they they were trying to come up with ideas for this ride, and uh, they were thinking about imagination, and, you know, and. Tony was watching uh, Hawaii Five-0 with Tom Selleck. And there was this scene where uh, there's some animal that's, that's eating the grass, you know, Tom Selleck's grass. And he's getting really frustrated with the gardener because he comes out there every day and the, the lawn is ruined, you know. And the gardener's trying to tell him that, that this thing is just a figment of imagination. This, this creature that's been eating his grass is just a figment of a, his imagination. And Tom, and the character goes, figments don't eat grass, right? And, and boom, and he, that's when he goes, oh, figment. It's a fig, figment, and the figment of your imagination, figment. That's where the character's figment comes out of. So even he was just watching this TV show in his off time at work, just trying to figure out, you know, not necessarily thinking about work, um, but that just, that little nugget would uh with that spark that inspiration right uh, one little spark that becomes the song one little spark uh <clears throat> in, the, in the ride so um looking for inspiration in, in in areas you might not have normally uh suspected it uh certainly listening to your muses um you know i pers i personally like to draw upon uh, upon history uh that's that's sort of history is sort of a, a you know a hobby of mine i love i love history and so i like to sort of use that for inspiration but um finding i would say find those things that that really motivate you that drive you um those 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 passions of your own and and, and searching searching in there usually usually um kind of give you if you can start with a nugget of something that worked for you you can start to extrapolate that for out for something that worked for other people Right. And so usually it's, it's, it's good to start with something that was really meaningful to you um, and then see if you can actually apply that to a design. Awesome. Well, I think we'll sort of wrap it up here. It's been a nice hour and a half, a little over your time. So thank you so much for- no, Sorry I rambled on so long. And, no, no, it's, I'm just worried about taking up your time, but- No, no, it's, it's, I, it's all good. I, uh, okay, I'd yeah. rather be doing this than changing diapers. So. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, evens out, I guess. <laughs>
I love awesome. you, honey. My wife's probably yeah. gonna be watching watching <laughs> yeah fair enough <laughs> yeah all right well awesome thank you so much i really appreciate yeah. it is there any way anyone here can reach out to you if so yeah um, my uh my school email is s u s l e at n d dot e d u if you could put it in the chat that would probably sure be. let me uh, let me type that in right now s u s l e and feel free to reach out if you have any um you know have any questions about um wdi or if you want to talk about you know maybe a um, employability potentially having a career there if, if you want my advice um, on that sort of thing i'm not currently an, an employee and there's no guarantee I'll, I'll i'll get to go back um but I, I can just from what i know i can i can try and give you guys some advice if you're interested well thanks again so much i really appreciate it and i hope uh Y'all have a good night and thanks again, Sam, so much. Really appreciate it. Yeah.